Welcome back to the Pursuit Zone podcast. I'm Paul Schmid, and I interview explorers that dream big, break out of their comfort zones, and take on ambitious pursuits. This is episode 204 with Ali Hunter Smart. In this episode, we talk about his walk across India and the film he made about it titled The Road to Independence. Let's start the show and let me introduce my guest. At the end of 2016, he left his job to begin two months of planning for a walk across India from Turtuk in the north to Kanyakumari in the south. The walk would begin in 2017, the year marking 70 years of Indian independence. The goal of the expedition was to learn about how independence and partition affected the people that lived through it, as well as to demonstrate that with careful planning and determination, it is possible to walk over seven months and 4,500 kilometers through high altitude, extreme heat, and monsoon rains with a 50-year-old rucksack. He also made a film about the journey titled The Road to Independence. You can learn more about the film and his adventures at OllieHunterSmart.com. Ollie Hunter Smart, welcome to the Pursuit Zone. Hi there. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, uh, you, you really picked out some of the, the key points of that journey. <laughs> Ollie, where are you from in the UK? Uh, so I grew up on the south coast of England, a, a town called Poole, right on the south coast. Uh, I spent my time you know, in boats, uh, going on the water, rarely spending any time actually at home. Before you did the India trip, it looks like you were employed in some way. What job did you do? Yeah, I work in digital marketing and advertising in London. And before I did the India trip, I was working on a, a digital transformation project for a healthcare brand, a healthcare company. And the reason the trip kind of came out about really was I was reading an article on the way to work and uh, learned about a little bit about independence. And, and I thought it'd be really interesting to kind of learn a bit more, really. Had you been to India before? No, I've, I've never been to India before. It's always a place I've wanted to visit. You know, the vibrancy, the colors, and sort of the community and culture that you sort of learn about uh, is something that's really fascinated me. But I'd never had the opportunity to, to visit India uh, until I came up with this idea and found this purpose to, to go there. When you were doing your research then um, and, and starting to learn about this process, what are kind of some of the, the points that we should know uh, before we get started talking about the journey? The real inspiration was uh, learning about Gandhi's salt march, which took place in uh, 1930. And uh, Gandhi walked as a protest against the British salt tax that had been imposed on the production of salt in India. So he walked 240 miles to the coast from his, ta uh, from his hometown, and he then harvested salt when he reached the shore. And that really kick-started the independence movement. A lot of people rallied behind his cause and his message. Uh, and they basically were saying, you know, we don't need the British ruling this country anymore. It gets much more complicated from there. And it's far more complicated than I think people really understand. So Britain had been ruling in India for the best part of 300 years. Uh, but it was obviously a relatively uh, kind of outdated model. Britain had just come out of the war, so we couldn't really afford to maintain our presence in India. And so we, we ultimately decided we were going to hand back power to the Indians, to the, you know, the population. That had its own complexities as well. You've got a Hindu leader who wanted a, a Hindu majority country to create something, uh, what, what they do nowadays call Hindustan. Uh, a lot of Indians refer to India as Hindustan. But at the same time, you've got a Muslim leader who was standing up for the rights of a, a minority. And you also had other people uh, such as Gandhi and so on, who wanted to try and keep the country you know, united. Uh, they'd seen definite improvements uh, in sort of the community that, uh, that had been created through being under British rule. And so they wanted to keep the country united. So it's, it's a really complex uh, complex issue and i think you know britain ultimately left within four months of announcing it that they were going to gain give india their independence it then created a whole another load of complexities and there was a lot of violence and struggle as people moved and migrated to uh, different parts of what was india but now then became india pakistan and bangladesh so you had to do 
two months of planning at least. Um, and I think it actually extended a bit because your original plan you weren't able to do. Give me an idea of what you were doing during those two months of planning. So for the two months of planning that I did out front, I was really looking at the routes that I was going to be taking. And that was based on the history. So I was learning a lot more about the history of, of India and the places that had particular uh, significance to that period of history, that struggle for freedom and independence, uh, but also places that Britain had a, a big influence as well. Places like Shimla, which was the became the British summertime capital as the sort of the leaders at the time escaped the stifling heat in Delhi. Uh, so my route, uh, you know, I placed dots on a map of all of these places and my route pretty much formed itself through that, through that learning of the history. Uh, but I was also thinking about how I was going to make a film. I really set out with that objective of, of making a film. So I thought about, you know, what kind of interview questions I wanted to ask uh, how I would try and meet people. And I actually arranged some of those meetings up front just to let people know that what I was doing and, you know, how I was going to, uh, when I was going to be there. Looking at the kind of skills I might need. Uh, so particularly in the mountain regions, I don't really have any experience in that kind of terrain. So I wanted to really try and gain as much knowledge and information as to uh, how to cope with those kind of circumstances. And then obviously, you know, looking at a different kit, what kind of kit I wanted to take and going out and purchasing all of that. As you mentioned, like that two months actually got extended to about four months in the end because the, the route that I wanted or when I wanted to start was, was going to be impossible due to the, the weather at the time. Uh, so I actually delayed the whole project by two months, which gave me a little bit longer to do more research into the history, but also teach myself a little bit more about how to use a camera and the skills I needed for that as well. Now, did you have any fixers on the ground in India that were helping you out? Yeah, I did. I did use a fixer in India. Uh, the reason for that is really because I wanted someone that knew the area, particularly in that the, the mountains, that that uh, knew places I could travel through to get ultimately down to Shimla. But also, they were going to be able to help me find, you know, a guide, some porters, potentially reach out to some people that I could interview as well. And they were incredibly useful. And I came across that fixer by reaching out to a friend of mine here in the UK who sort of organizes expeditions to remote and extreme places. And he said, oh, just just give this guy a try. He's on our, our list, our books. And so I did. I reached out to him, explained my project. We came to an agreement in terms of sort of the cost of getting uh, the support that I required. And it kind of went on from there, really. Now, how do you get to the starting point? I flew out to from London to Delhi uh, and then up to Leh. And then I, I actually met up with the guide that my fixer had put me in touch with up in Leh. And we spent a couple of days acclimatizing and getting the permits that we needed to get further north into the, the Nubra Valley. And essentially, once once we got that permit, we, we were given a seven-day permit. Uh, so we had to set off the following day. and We went up and over the mountain uh, in a taxi. There were a couple of other people in the taxi, you know, uh, locals trying to do that trip as well. And so, yeah, that's we essentially just kept on driving and driving along this road all the way out to Turtuk village. And it's remarkable seeing the landscape. Uh, you know, I was blown away by it. But actually to then spend the next kind of seven days walking through it as well, uh, you know, it, was, it certainly seemed a little bit daunting in that taxi ride. Now, let's talk about the rucksack, which got the name Zo. First of all, what does that name mean? <laughs> well, Zo uh, is a type of yak up in the, that region, in the Ladakh region. And the name came about because I was carrying so much kit. I had about 27 kilos worth of kit with me. And my guide and I, we were just sat down having a break at one point. And, and he said, oh, your, your bag is like Zo." And I said, I, I, what does that mean? And it's, he said, you know, we use yaks to carry things around the mountains for us, uh, you know, between villages and communities. And we load everything onto them. So, you know, whatever we need to move from one community to another, whether it's, you know, food or supplies or whatever, we stick it on the yak and, and the yak will walk there. Uh, and so he, he likened my bag to, to Zoe. Now, Zoe was actually a, a 1964 Carrymore rucksack. It was a canvas rucksack with a metal frame. And I really wanted to 
use this bag on a long journey. I wanted something that was going to blend in with the kind of environment that I was traveling through. And I figured a canvas rucksack was going to be the best solution. I found one on eBay and I bought it. And actually, I reached out to the guy that I bought it off uh, and he'd apparently used it on, on some climbs with Joe Brown, who's a very famous British mountaineer. But he wasn't quite certain as to what trips uh, the bag had actually been on. And so I spent a while just sort of, you know, preparing the canvas to make sure it was going to be waterproof, make sure that the steel frame was going to be kind of solid enough for the journey and so on. Uh, and I did all of that prep up front before I left. But yeah, 27 kilos was a hell of a lot of kit to be carrying. Now, are you carrying a full like wild camping setup? Yeah, I, I took a tent with me. In the mountains, I knew I was going to need it. And so was, I took a two-man tent to give myself some space, uh, allow me to put my rucksack and, and things inside the tent. But also I knew that at points I was going to have a, a guide and porters. And so I figured that, you know, we could share the tent as well. But I also had, you know, a winter sleeping bag. It got down to sort of, you know, minus 10 degrees at points, uh, 5, 10 degrees uh, at nighttime. So I had a, yeah, sleeping bag, roll mat. I took a little bit of food with me. But also all of the kind of electronics that I was carrying, you know, camera, microphone, tripod. But you've then got all of the chargers, spare batteries, memory cards. I had a laptop uh, to back up all my footage, power banks, a solar panel as well to make sure that if I couldn't get to electricity, at least I could charge up my keep the cameras rolling, as it were. Um, so, yeah, it's a, a lot of kit overall. Did you end up carrying all of your cold weather gear with you, though, the entire rest of the way? No, I, I didn't. I was actually super lucky. Uh, I have a friend that lives in Delhi or lived in Delhi. When I'd flown out to Delhi, I dropped a bag off of kind of hot climate kit at his. Then I flew up to the north and then I walked down through the Himalayas uh, back down to Delhi. And then I swapped a load of kit. That said, I was probably walking for about a month in relatively hot climate conditions in my, with all of this cold weather gear. So, you know, the thick sleeping bag. Uh, jumpers, jackets, and my kind of thick uh, and sturdy mountainous terrain kind of boots. As we see in the movie, the rucksack uh, does not turn out to be the most dependable thing. Uh, I mean, in terms of you need to get it fixed multiple times. <laughs> yeah. If you were to go back, uh, would you use the same rucksack or would you do, take something more modern? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, I would still use a similar type of rucksack. My bag actually broke on the first day. One of the shoulder straps gave way. So it didn't start out well. Uh, and it continued to kind of test my patience as it broke numerous times. And in fact, I think by the end of the, you know, the very southern tip of India, I'd had 17 repairs done on the bag, including having to get the, the steel frame welded back together. And there were loads of patches on the inside of the bag. But I'd kind of set out with the ambition that I wanted to get this bag the length of India. In addition to that, you know, I was making the film and, and I wanted that continuity. And it, it, essentially in the film, it sort of becomes a bit of a character as well. But yeah, I would definitely use a similar type of bag. That bag won't be able to do that trip again, for sure. But I'd use a similar type of bag because I think it, it blends in with the environment that I'm traveling through. I also think, you know, a bright, shiny, modern, high-tech rucksack actually looks a bit more like a target it looks like there's you know value there could have ultimately made me uh, a little bit vulnerable in terms of uh, kind of opportunists should we call them uh, but i didn't have any issues with you know having anything stolen at all uh, probably because they looked at that bag and thought well there can't be much valuable kit in there <laughs> you mentioned the seven days on the permit i just want to just try to understand something here because in my notes here i have that you and your guide who's named namgyal you take like 15 days to walk through this portion of the Himalayas. What was the seven days for? Uh, so the seven days, seven day permit was issued for traveling from Turtuk. So the start of my uh, uh, start of my journey, which Turtuk is a village that sits on the right on the border between India and Pakistan. It's about five miles uh, from the Pakistan border. So that was where I was starting my journey. And the permit gave me permission to walk along the Nubra Valley past a big sort of town and monastery called Diskit, and then up and over Kadungla and part way down from Kadungla down to Leh. 
that's where the permit is required. We took seven days to cover that bit. And then once we were in Ley, then we were we were fine. We didn't need any more permits to travel through that region. And then the next sort of uh, uh, six, seven days was actually to get out to Lamayuru, which was sort of the, the next monastery and where Namgyal, my guide, would ultimately leave me. What was it like going over that pass? It was really weird. You know, where the military base was, where they checked our permits, it, there was no snow on the ground at all. And then it just progressively got worse and worse the higher we climbed. And the road was really winding its way up. It was a very steep and high mountain pass. It's uh, 5,600 5, meters up. And as we were going up, the weather was started to get much worse. The, the clouds really started to come in. It got really windy. And then the snow came. And, you know, the, the road itself was just covered in ice. And I could see all these cars just slowly winding their way down. And they would pass us. And we'd kind of keep progressing. Uh, going going up and over the pass and yeah altitude started to affect my guide he was he was walking really slowly and I sort of you know tried to keep up his spirits his motivation kind of explain that ultimately we need to get to the top otherwise we're not going to get back down the other side today he eventually kind of got it and pushed on ahead but the higher I climbed I began to feel those effects of altitude sickness and it wasn't in the sense of kind of mentally you know, headaches and that sort of thing. But it was more that like, I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't control my legs. They were sliding around on the, on the icy road, a bit bit like a drunkard. I couldn't really think straight. So, you know, trying to work out how far or how long we'd been walking would take me, you know, I'd actually have to physically count it out on my fingers. And it was, yeah, it was a really strange feeling. And then, you know, as soon as we started going back down the other side, you really started to to regain all of those, uh, you know, mobility and uh, your sort of your mental state as well. When you guys reach Lamayuru, as you mentioned, you part ways with your guide and then you pick up a new crew that goes with you. Was this a crew that you organized or did, was this part of the fixer? Uh, yeah, no, it's part of the fixer. The fixer organized two guides for me. Uh, the first was Nam Gyal, uh, who would take me from the start all the way to Lamayuru. And that was an area he'd grown up in. He knew, you know, we even stayed with his parents one evening as we walked through their town, their village. I then switched guides and actually picked up some porters as well uh, at Lamayuru. Uh, because from that moment on, we were going to be traveling over the trails and passes, the high mountain passes, uh, all the way down to a place called Dasha. And so I needed that additional support so that we could carry the volume of food and equipment that we were going to need for those trails. It sounds like you had some challenges now that you've got a bigger crew and you've got all these extra personalities on board and maybe they don't have the, maybe they're not keeping to the schedule that you want to keep. Um, What were some of the challenges with having to deal with all these new people? Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a challenge. You know, as I mentioned, the terrain is, is not, not easy. But also, you know, I was on, I had my own agenda, you know, I was on this long journey and I just wanted to try and cover this trek, this distance in as short a time as, uh, as I could. And then Ilamayura to Dasha Trek is a trail that loads of tourists take uh, during the summertime months. Uh, and it really opens up in about June, July uh, for hikers. And it normally takes them sort of 20 days, 21 days. I was trying to do this in 14 uh, because I wanted to kind of get through this also you know every day is is relatively expensive for me I was paying for for the porters and the guide uh, so you know the quicker we could get through it the quicker I would stop those uh, those costs yeah I mean the first day I got my, my boots got wet as we, we were crossing a river uh, and I wasn't really sure about how I was going to dry them out you know I didn't think it was going to be uh, an easy thing to do the second day, my porters then hitched a ride, which took them ages to try and catch a ride. And ultimately, the vehicle that was that did pick them up only took them, you know, a couple of kilometers up the road. So they, I was then waiting for them uh, for quite a while. Uh, and then on the third pass, oh, sorry, the third day, we we crossed over our first really snowy mountain pass. And I mean, they were in, they were wearing wellies. And they were carrying, you know, 15 kilos probably each. And it was it was incredible watching them 
go up these slopes because I didn't know how they could stay, you know, grounded why they weren't just slipping down all this, this ice. It was so steep and, and icy. And I was really struggling. In fact, I had to put crampons on to, to get up the, the ice, but uh, they seemed to crack on. It was incredible watching them in their own kind of environment uh, and how they dealt with that. Uh, but the landscape around us was just stunning. It was really, really beautiful. And we stopped in in a town called Padham. We spent a day there and we just you know, bought some new supplies and kind of had a bit of a rest. Uh, the following day, I then we set off again and I ended up having a bit of a, a mutiny on my hands because they then said, oh, you know, we're not walking more than six hours a day. Uh, that's what we should be walking. And yet we'd reached, you know, our six hours by the time we got to lunchtime. So sort of one o'clock, two o'clock ish, and a good another couple of hours that we could have been walking. And they said, no, flat out, we're not walking any further today, which I got a little bit frustrated about you know, because I wanted to do it as quickly as I could. Uh, they also then turned around and said, you know, we haven't been paid yet. So I'd paid my fixer, but they hadn't been paid by him. They turned around and said, you know, we, we're not going to move at all moving forwards. We can just walk back to our villages and, you know, and leave you here. And it was a hard negotiation, but, you know, I really had to to use all of my negotiation skills and to really kind of persuade them to to help me through the next sort of five, six days so that I could get to Dasha uh, and continue on my trek as normal, as planned. Well, you guys end up making it there. This is where you part ways and going forward, you're on your own. So at this point, what's it been, about 30 days and five, 600 kilometers? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would say I'd been on the road for, for a month. Uh, I'd had 15 days with Namgel, 16 days with these guys. But I was actually really looking forward to this stage because I was now fully in control of the distances I, I could travel and the route essentially up until that point I sort of felt as if I'd been a little bit hampered by obviously my teammates and yeah it was it was it was really exciting to get going now I wanted to ask you at this point like how, how's your body holding up how are your legs doing how are your feet doing <laughs> they, they weren't too bad actually you know, yes, I was feeling tired and my shoulders were pretty sore because I'd been carrying. Well, I'd now, you know, when I had the porters, we'd split up my kit a little bit so that they were carrying some of it, some of that weight. But then all of a sudden I had everything on my back. So it was, a, it was the full 27 kilos plus then the tripod that I was carrying in my hand as well. Yeah, so my shoulders were pretty sore. My feet, they were fine up until this point, but I would soon realized that actually you know wearing thick sturdy uh, winter walking boots on the some of the roads as the climate was really starting to warm up became a big challenge i began to get these huge blisters on my feet which then ultimately one becomes infected i've got blisters underneath my toenails which is something i'd never thought about or experienced before and actually that then really brought down my my morale and my motivation to keep moving forwards and I, I took a day off and I phoned up my, I remember phoning up my mum saying, I, I just don't know if I can do this. I don't think I should be traveling in this way. And she said, you know, uh, ultimately you put yourself in that situation. You know what you're capable of. Um, and so, you know, with that day off and, and sort of that, that extra added motivation, I was just like, right, I'll take each day as it comes. And I set myself a, sort of a time limit and I said if I haven't laughed or smiled or met someone that's interesting in the next four days uh, when I would reach Shimla then I could rethink about how I was going to travel but until that point you know I was going to continue as planned and ultimately you know within probably within 12 hours I'd met someone that was really interesting or uh, you know had a laugh at something that uh, had, had happened with you know some locals so uh, it's it's amazing how resilient the body is and how you can kind of motivate yourself to keep going. But it's not always something that we we know how to kind of activate and, and kind of really dig deep to 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 get to that point. Did those boots, I mean, past Delhi, did you still have those boots? No. So in, in Delhi, I actually switched boots out of the, the thicker, uh, rugged terrain boots into desert boots. That was a great option. I didn't have a one set of blisters 
in the desert boots. And those boots lasted me all the way down to the very southern tip. There was a couple of uh, times where I had to get them repaired. You know, they'd started breaking on the top uh, canvas in the monsoon rains. You know, they were just getting so wet and then drying out very quickly and and it was just a cyclical process and you know the the material wasn't strong enough for that uh, and then right down towards the very southern tip I started adding bits of car tire that I would find on the side of the road because the the heels had worn down so much I thought I'd try and tack on a bit of uh, a bit of car tire to give that you know make them flatter again at least give it a bit more cushioning uh, and that that worked really well so they did last the whole trip but again they won't be going doing another journey <laughs> you continue on one of your destinations coming up is uh udaipur and your goal for getting there is the august 15th independence day celebration which you're very excited about because you are assuming that you know a bigger city will have a big celebration but in order to get there first you have to i think walk one of your longest days which was around 47 kilometers when you're on this big day, uh, first of all, what kind of temperatures are you experiencing at this point? The temperatures were probably 35-ish degrees. Uh, so it wasn't super, super hot. Uh, I'd been through the the super, super hot temperatures of sort of 49, 50 degrees. So it had started to cool down a bit. But yeah, it was. Uh, I guess I was following the road pretty much for that whole day. Uh, so there was relatively flat, relatively straightforward. But I think part of it was the weight that I was carrying and trying to keep myself moving forwards relatively quickly, but also do a bit of filming here and there. And uh, I also actually, I'd spent the night with a, a school principal. And so he then invited me to go and do a talk at the school that he was principal of that morning, uh, which obviously delayed me setting off uh, on my long walk. And I'd, I'd kind of planned that I was going to spend Independence Day in a big city, as you say, to to really kind of experience and soak up the celebrations. And I'd done a bit of research as to, into what celebrations were going to be taking place. So I left the sort of the, the countryside and made my way to the city. And it was a big disappointment uh, when I got there. You know, I was expecting a big celebration, but actually there was a, a military procession uh, some schools, that sort of thing. But most people spend the time with their families on that day. So they don't really kind of go out and celebrate too much. Uh, so I'd kind of made a big mistake by heading to the city. I should have actually stayed with that principal and, and kind of joined the school celebrations in a, a much smaller community. As you're traveling along, are you are you still mostly wild camping or are you staying in small hotels or... Are you getting invited in by people to stay with them? No. So I, I stopped wild camping really at the bottom of the Himalayas, mainly because there weren't any places that I could find to put up my tent. India is such a populated country. The, the land was taken up by agriculture or communities or for cattle grazing, that sort of thing. Or, you know, it'd been turned into a rubbish tip, ultimately. So there were very few places for me to actually wild camp and put my tent up. Uh, so I was really relying on guest houses, hotels, uh, you know, and so on as I was traveling. Uh, and I would always ask people, you know, where the next hotel was or whether there was one in that that community that I was heading to. What I did find is in different states, people refer to them as different things. So a hotel is actually not a hotel. That's a, a, a restaurant. Uh, but they would call them yeah residences lodges guest houses uh, you, you name it but it changed in every state so i'd have to kind of go in in a circular cycle of questions as to where the nearest guest houses lodges residence and so on or i would just walk into communities and say is there anywhere i can put up my tent to sleep tonight and i would get invited into someone's house you know given some tea sat down start having a chat and you know come 8 p.m they would say oh just you're staying here tonight you're staying with us we'll give you food uh so i was welcomed into so many people's homes and into the communities i spent time sleeping in schools i slept in a government office in temples uh so yeah real mix of mix of places 
So as you're going along on this journey, you're setting up the tripod, you're filming, you're, you have interviews that you're doing with people. You know, what, what was that experience like? Were you, were people fascinated by what you were doing with this camera and tripod? People were very fascinated by what I was doing. Not that I would actually tell them what I was doing up front. Uh, you know, it's very hard for a lot of them to comprehend the scale and the distance of what I was traveling. So I would normally start the conversation by saying, oh, I, I started in that place, which was the place that I stayed the night before or maybe, you know, two, three days before. And then I'd say a place that I was heading to that, again, wasn't the end destination, but was maybe two, three days ahead of me. Uh, and it was only once they understood that and the distance that I'd be traveling in that that section and if they were kind of interested further, I would then say, oh, well, actually, I'm going on to Mumbai or Mumbai, and then I'm going down to Kanyukumari. And then you sort of see their eyes light up and be like, what? Where did you start? And I'd say, oh, I started at the very top. I realized pretty quickly that they were not never going to be able to comprehend the full distance, full length of the country. Uh, but if I broke it down into small sections, they, they could very easily understand um, but yeah, they were fascinated with what I was doing. I had people join me for, you know, half a day, a day. They would always stop me in, in pretty much every community that I walked through for a selfie. You know, a lot of these places are, are then certainly not on the tourist trail. And so, you know, they don't really get white people or Westerners walking through their village. Uh, so it was quite a, a novelty to have someone doing that. You went in do this with the goal of speaking to the people about independence and the partition era and the effect on India and the people. And so you're asking these sorts of questions, I guess, when you're, you are interviewing some of the people, did any of the responses that you got from them uh, surprise you at all? Yeah. I mean, you know, I hadn't really arranged many interviews before I went there. So I was really just meeting people in the communities and, uh, you know, some people said, Oh, you need to speak to that person. I'll introduce you. So I was just kind of finding people with very interesting stories as I was going. One thing I was very conscious of when I certainly when I started really interviewing people was that, you know, I'm a white British guy walking through what was a country under British rule and asking some relatively tough questions about, you know, the impact of the British on India. Uh, and so I, I started in a very sort of hesitant way. As I got more confident in, you know, the responses that I was receiving, I realized that people actually, you know, they were very happy that Britain had a presence in India because of the improvements that, that Britain had, had made to the, to the whole country, the nation. Uh, and so actually the questions became much easier. But I did hear some, some incredible stories about people's experience of partition and independence you know, one woman, she's told me about the t when the time came to move. So just after independence had happened, they were having to move from uh, what is now Pakistan into, into India, the Punjab region. And she said, my father gave me three items. One was a gold bangle that I could use to sell if I needed any money to buy food or whatever. The second item was a small bag of chili powder, which her mother had sewed inside her clothing. And she could use that chili powder to throw in the eyes of anyone that tried to attack her. And the third item, and I really couldn't believe I was hearing this, but she was given a small dagger by her father. And her father said, you need to use this dagger on yourself if you fall into the hands of the enemy. And I was just stunned in silence at, at hearing that story. Uh, but it wasn't just, you know, one story. I, I heard very similar stories uh, of people's experiences of, of that migration. And it just, it did leave me in, in shock each and every time I heard something like that. Yeah, I think that's the part of the film where the guy telling that story gets very emotional, if I remember right. Yeah, it, it's, it's really hard one to, to kind of get out of your head uh, once you've heard something like that. And you don't really know how it's going to affect you. You know, certainly I was... I was noticeably sort of quiet and more contemplative in the couple of days after that I'd heard that story. Eventually you, you pick up the salt march route and you are walking along that. Did you find as you walked along it and 
you were talking to people. Are they still aware in India of the Salt March route? Is it still a, um, I guess, a big part of their history? So the Salt March route is is definitely a big part of their history, and it is still it's it's marked out as a heritage trail, certainly for motorists. Uh, so you can drive along the Salt March route very easily. For walkers, it's much less of a, a sort of a pilgrimage route. Very few people have done it uh, or do it. Quite a few Westerners have done it, but uh, you know. Indians that have done it don't tend to document it. You know, it's, I guess it's just kind of part and parcel of their their history and, and and kind of interest. But yeah, it's it's a very visible route that a lot of people do. You know, they'll do it on a motorbike in a couple of days, really. So when you were along the Salt March route, did you meet anybody interesting? I met a couple of really interesting people. Uh, I met a guy that was he was about ninety three years old. He'd been at some of Gandhi's rallies back in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, I actually stayed with a family who had hosted Gandhi and the marchers as they walked through their community, uh, which was fascinating insight into kind of what happened. You know, there was, I think, one photo that they had from that day. And, you know, I asked silly questions like, what did your grandfather give them to eat? You know, and it was relatively simple food you know rice and and beans that sort of thing uh, but it was quite interesting something i hadn't had the opportunity to find out from anyone else and they actually then introduced me to mahatma gandhi's great grandson tushar gandhi he lives in mumbai now and um, so they said oh you know we'll introduce you to him and so i then had an interview with him when i got to mumbai which was fascinating because I got to ask a whole load of questions. And although he hadn't met his great grandfather, I got to ask a whole load of questions about what Gandhi, the family man, was like. But also, I asked a question about, you know, what Gandhian views and beliefs or how Gandhian views and beliefs and philosophy are still relevant in the world that we live in today. And, and his response was, was fascinating. He has the sense that we shouldn't elevate Gandhi to a godly status. Uh, because if we just worship him, we'll stop em- emulating him and we'll continue to sort of, you know, drive society down. So so actually, we should just follow his his views and beliefs today as, as they have done previously. Yeah, when I was watching the movie and I was taking notes, as soon as I heard him say that, I immediately paused it and wrote it down into my notes because I thought that's a great way to think about it. Don't worship the guy follow what he does or emulate what he does in your own life. Mm, Exactly. It was a fascinating conversation and I was very fortunate that he then said, Oh, you know, stay for, stay for lunch. Uh, So I got to meet all of his family as well. Now this whole time that you're walking, are you just using your phone to navigate? I did mainly use my phone for navigation. It's just easier. I had a, a SIM card, you know, with local data connection. So I would look at Google Maps to to work out my route. I would try and avoid the main highways. They are very visible on the map, but I would try and get off those because I knew that I wasn't going to meet interesting people on that main highway. And it was also, you know, very dusty, dirty and and relatively dangerous. Uh, but I would use a combination of Google Maps and uh, another app called Maps.me, which is sort of an open source mapping system. And I I found the combination of those worked really well. But also I had some maps from the 1950s on me. I was marking my route and progress every day on these maps. I had, I think it was about 35 maps I was carrying, paper maps. But I I was really interested in how the maps had changed versus today and whether the routes that I was actually taking were still on the maps. And a lot of the place names have changed. You know, they've got much more uh, Indian names now than they did uh, when the maps were made just after the British times. So, uh, yeah, that was quite interesting as well. Did you ever get lost? Only, I got lost a couple of times in the mountains. But, uh, yeah, it really wasn't more than an, a sort of an hour off track uh, when I realized I'd gone up a wrong road and had to walk back down it again. But other than that, I was I was pretty much on it in terms of my navigation, which is good to know. <laughs> it saved me walking extra distance that I didn't need to cover. So what are you eating when you're out there? I was eating anything I really came across. 
What I found is food very much changes with the agriculture. So in the north, the food is quite spicy. They grow a lot of chilies in that area. Then when I traveled down through Gujarat, they grow a lot of sugarcane in that region. And the food is therefore much sweeter. A lot of the curries have quite a bit of sugar in and they have a lot of very sweet desserts. And then in the south, uh, things become much more sort of coconutty, uh, a bit more creamier curries and so on. Um, so generally for dinner time, I would eat in little restaurants, uh, what they call dabas, uh, but also in, you know, with a family, I'd eat whatever they fed me, really. Uh, and that was curry pretty much every day. Uh, but for, for my lunch, I would actually find it really difficult to find food to eat at lunchtime. There were no sandwiches or anything like that. Occasionally, I would find a samosa, which is sort of a little parcel of curried vegetables in some pastry. Uh, and then breakfast time, I would eat a lot of fruit and uh, bread. Uh, but I also found I carried, I managed to come across some peanut butter. So I carried a kilo of peanut butter with me, uh, which I would then eat on bread or biscuits with bananas and uh, other fruit that I could come across. The way you said that, it makes it sound like peanut butter is a rare commodity there. It is a rare commodity. And I actually went to the point of trying to find a place where I could buy peanuts and then find someone that could blend the peanuts up before I'd come across this, you know, the peanut butter. But yeah, it's, it's not something they really consume a lot of, uh, despite growing a lot of peanuts, uh, certainly in the South. Yeah. Did you ever end up getting sick the whole time um, over the, let me see, how many days were you there? I have this in my notes somewhere. 228. Yeah, 200. Did you ever get sick over that time frame? I did get sick over the over the seven and a half months I was there. The first time I was sick was actually just after I'd left my guide in Porters and I'd got to a, a city called Manali and I was pretty hungry and I'd, you know, we'd been eating noodles and rice and, and things on the trek, on the trails, which we'd been carrying, but there was very little fresh food. And suddenly I got to this city and I was like, oh, wow, look at all of this amazing fresh produce. And I had something called chicken momos or like they're basically chicken dumplings. And that was the first time I got sick. That chicken was not good. It tasted amazing at the time. But four days later, I had the worst stomach and I couldn't really stay awake throughout the day. Um, you know, I was just so nauseous and uh, struggling to to kind of get through it. Actually, the person I was staying with took me off to the doctor to go and get some antibiotics uh, at that point. And then the second time I got sick, partway down through the country near Gujarat and I'd obviously consumed either food or drink but it had giardia in it which uh, is a waterborne parasite and that had got into my system as well and I've had giardia before from another journey the Amazon that I did so I knew the symptoms straight away and I text uh, sent a text message to my cousin who's a doctor and said what antibiotics do I need for giardia and she sent one back I went to a pharmacy, showed them the message, and it was about, you know, 20 pence uh, to get a week's worth of antibiotics, which is the equivalent of what, I don't know, 30, 40 cents dollars. Uh, so, yeah, didn't cost me much. But, uh, yeah, it, it's amazing how when you are physically ill, how that can affect your mental state. I'd never come across that before, but, yeah, it really started to affect me mentally. Yeah, the uh, the giardia, that can be a serious thing. You know, I'm preparing for a, an interview. It hasn't happened yet, but um, this woman was cycling through India, and I think it was like Varanasi. I think that's the name of a place up north. Yeah, yeah. And she caught it. But for her, it was very, very serious. And um, yeah, it's good. It's nice to have that, that kind of that doctor in your back pocket that can give you advice on what to get and get it quickly. Yeah. Um, I mean, one of the things is, that is really tricky is, is language. You know, I, there was no way I was going to know or be able to write down whatever the Latin name was that might be used for the antibiotic. And so by actually being able to just, you know, show someone a, a text message and say, that's what I need, uh, massively helped. 
One question I haven't asked yet, and I'm, I'm kind of curious about is, what kind of wildlife do you see out there as you're walking? Is there, is it just like birds or do you see, I guess you're going to run into livestock and things like that, but any type of wildlife that you see? Yeah, I would say in the, in the mountains, there are a few bits of wildlife, you know, sort of uh, ibex, mountain goat type uh, creatures. They were probably the biggest thing, but actually throughout the rest of the country, there wasn't anything that was too sort of noticeable. As I said, the, the whole country is actually very populated. Uh, you know, a lot of the land has been taken up by agriculture and communities. So, yeah, there isn't really much kind of wild space out there uh, unless you're walking through like a tiger reserve or something like that, in which case there are wild elephants, leopards, tigers and so on, uh, which is actually something I had to do the further south I got. I'd reached a community and I was staying with their family and the kid said to me, you know, how do you avoid being attacked by a tiger? And I said, I, d I don't know what you mean. Like, you know, it hadn't really crossed my mind that they would be an issue or could be an issue. And, you know, I went straight to Google and started looking at all these news reports of uh, locals, farmers and, and so on that had been taken by tigers. And so I thought, actually, maybe this is something I need to think about. And so I looked at my map and I was like, right, well, actually, the route I'm on, there is no way through without going through a tiger reserve. And I thought about going back north and cutting across to one of the coasts and then go, well, going down the coast. But that was going to take me three weeks to a month extra time that I didn't really have the energy for, but uh, also the time as well. And so I thought, well, I'll just keep going and see if I can find a solution. And I phoned up one of the park rangers of the national park. And I said, you know, is there any way that the rangers could shadow me for a day? I knew it was going to take me one day to get through that forest. And they just turned around and said, yeah, there's nobody is walking through our national park. This is the most tiger populated national park in the country. There's no way anyone could walk through it. So I looked at options and thought, well, do you know what? The second route didn't look so bad. It was a little bit longer. And I thought, well, okay, I'm going to hire a car. I'm going to hire a taxi. And that way the taxi could drive behind me at five kilometers an hour, the speed I was walking at. And they could keep an eye out for any of these wild animals, you know, leopards, tigers, and so on. Uh, and if I felt in danger, I could get into the car. And if I felt it was safe enough, then I could keep walking. But uh, there was actually a section that I had to do before I'd managed to, to find someone that could shadow me. So I had to do that on my own. And it was absolutely terrifying because I would hear all of these little noises, whether it was monkeys or uh, little rodents or anything in the forest. And suddenly I would stop and I'd look around trying to find, you know, any sight of any animal. Uh, you know, and there, there wasn't actually anything, but uh, yeah, it was terrifying. And then the following day, I had the, the next sort of longer section of the forest to walk through with this taxi shadowing me. And it was actually a breeze. You know, it was, I could stop when I wanted to. I spoke to some park rangers. They didn't seem to be too fussed about the fact that this guy was walking through the national park. So yeah, it was, it was a very strange experience. So there is wildlife out there, but uh, only in kind of small pockets, I would say. So eventually you make it to the end in Kanyakumari and there's a, a temple there. And what, what was it like for you when you reached the end of the walk? Reaching Kanyakumari was a very interesting uh, kind of emotion. I wasn't really expecting it. So Kanyakumari has this, this temple to Gandhi, which sits right on the, the coast. And the temple itself has been built to be kind of multi-religion, uh, uh, multicultural. So it's got elements of all the different religions uh, there's some christian icons uh, hindu muslim and so on and then gandhi's ashes were actually stood in the center of this temple and so that the sunlight would directly shine down onto the ashes the point where the ashes stood on his birthday you know i reached this temple and i saw it and i'd seen pictures of it before and thought you know this is what i've been aiming for but it was a really bizarre experience. I didn't really feel anything. I was like underwhelmed by it. And there were a lot of tourists sort of going about there, you know, doing touristy things. There were a lot of 
shops selling tat, you know, hoodies and T-shirts and things. There were quite a lot of pilgrims that had done, you know, similar journeys, but a lot of them travel by bus to get there. So it's it's less of a sort of, you know, physical pilgrimage for them. It's It's more of a spiritual one. And I think even, you know, to myself, it was going to take a long time for it to sink in the fact that tomorrow I wasn't getting up again and walking another 30, 40 kilometers. So, yeah, it was a very bizarre experience and, and feeling. And I guess a lot of expeditions, when there's no kind of set finish line or goal, uh, a lot of expeditions do end up on a bit of a, you know, a kind of an underwhelming sensation. Yeah. So what did you find to be the most challenging part of the the expedition? <laughs> I think the most challenging part of the expedition was actually making the film itself. In my mind, the journey was actually pretty simple and straightforward. Uh, but it was coming back to the UK and creating the story that I wanted to tell based on the interviews that I'd done and uh, you know the comments and the people I'd met and so on, and then actually editing that together. But from the actual expedition, I think it was probably the bit after the salt march route heading down to Mumbai. Mentally, it was it was really tough. And I'd kind of got bored of being in India by that point. I'd gone off the food. I was really bored of the number of selfies that I was being asked for. And I realized as I was heading up to a place called Pune that I'd spent the best part of three, three and a half months walking through the flat plains of India. So from the bottom of the Himalayas all the way down to to the Western Ghats, which is the, the, the mountain region in the south. So there'd been no kind of texture in the landscape and nothing for me to judge the distance that I'd been traveling each day or aim for as I was walking. And suddenly I had this, you know, this kind of epiphany that, oh, now that I've got mountains, I've got things to aim for. And I started enjoying it much more. But yeah, it was definitely a mental challenge rather than the physical challenge that I found the hardest. What do you find to be, when you look back, what are the memories that pop into your head? I get different memories, uh, you know, every single day. I might just suddenly remember one thing and think, oh, I remember that person that I spoke to. And it would be totally irrelevant to what I was just thinking. But suddenly that, you know, the image of that person suddenly pops into my mind. But I think the the most memorable thing was actually meeting uh, Tushar Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi's great grandson. Never in my wildest dreams had I imagined that I would have that opportunity to speak to him and meet him and kind of share a, a kind of a uh, share that shared interest with him. Uh, you know, it was it was a really special moment. Let's talk about the making of the film because this is um, the creative process is always the part that I find fascinating. I guess the first question I want to ask is what were you using for your equipment, like your camera and your audio, for example? Yeah, so the camera equipment, I kept it as, as simple as I could. I had a Canon XF105, which is sort of a, a very small production quality video camera, camcorder. And it's used for sort of, you know, reporting in war zones, that sort of thing. So it was kind of ideal for the for the job, for the expedition. And then that had a shotgun mic on top, so it could catch a, a decent level of audio uh, from interviews and so on. And then I used a lapel mic if I was doing an interview that I would just plug into my phone, or uh, I actually had a, a little uh, audio recorder as well. And then the tripod. Um, so that was kind of my really basic camera setup. I also had a stills camera that was capable of taking video, HD video, which actually became critical because my the, the main video camera actually broke a couple of times uh, throughout the journey. So I had to get that repaired and I wanted to kind of keep filming and, you know, keep rec uh, moving forwards. So I ended up relying on that, that slightly sort of lower quality camera. But I also filmed bits and pieces on my mobile as well. Uh, and I think the mobile is a great tool because it, when you approach people with a video camera pointed at them, a lot of people kind of shut down uh, and they stop talking naturally. Whereas if you have a, a, a mobile phone sort of pointed towards them, they're very used to that. And so you can actually capture much more natural content uh, just by using your phone. 
and the quality nowadays is is phenomenal so uh, yeah definitely worth or not ruling it out i would say yeah i i didn't notice it when i watched the film so you did a good job of blending it all together <laughs> thank you yeah <laughs> just a curiosity as an, a podcaster guy um what was the audio device that you had like a little zoom exactly it's a zoom i think it's hc1 is it h1 the small one h, h, h1 yeah so it's got the yeah it's got the uh, the microphones on top but you can also plug an external microphone in via just a, like a headphone jack three mil jack did you use it much i used it for all of my interviews because i couldn't be certain of the audio quality that I was going to get from the the shotgun mic uh so i recorded all of the interviews with the lapel mic i didn't really use it other than that hmm. okay well so it looks like it worked good then yeah i mean actually to be honest i can't i think in the when i was editing it i've got uh obviously you've got the different audio channels inputs so you've got the shotgun mic and i've got the and that's stereo so i can split that out and then i've got the recording the 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 zoom recording and so i think i've got an element of both channels two channels on at the same time because i found that the shotgun mic the audio was very deep the voice you know was uh, very deep but it also picked up a lot of background noise as well but the zoom mic was a little bit tinny obviously because of the quality of the the lapel mic uh so kind of a, a combination of both actually worked quite well so are you saying in the edit, you actually had two audio tracks and you laid them on top of one another? Yeah, exactly. And then I, I actually had three because the, the camera had a internal microphone as well. Hmm, interesting. So I just basically worked through them and worked out, you know, if I needed a little bit more tinniness to the audio, once I'd got them aligned up in the correct, you know, at the correct points, I could then have a little bit of the tinniness coming through on the shotgun mic as well. It's probably not the right way to be doing it, but <laughs> it sort of worked for me. Yeah, I hadn't never thought of it. I just would have picked one and then just yeah. used, put some equalization on it. Yeah, again, it's down to lack of lack of knowledge and skills. But who knows? Maybe that's a better uh, way to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. How much footage did you take out there and how much did you, when you got back, did you have to sort through? Do you know what? I actually don't know how much footage I took. I recorded a lot. I came back with four one or two terabyte hard drives, which were full of, of video content. Some some of that was obviously backups as well. But yeah, in short, there's a lot of footage. There's also a lot of footage I never actually looked at. Uh, because I had to make the film with a deadline in mind, I actually didn't bother looking at all of the footage first. I started working out my story and then edited to that. So a lot of it is done on memory. A lot of the film is done based on memory of sequences I shot or interviews that I thought were particularly interesting. And yeah, again, not really the right way to do it, I don't think. But uh, I'm sure there's a lot of great footage in there that I would love to get through at some point. But uh, yeah, you can't include it all. So is it expensive to make a film like this? Did you find that you needed to do any crowdfunding of any type? So I actually didn't do any crowdfunding. Uh, I set off with on the expedition with the ambition of making a film. And that is because I'd got a mentor on board who said that, you know, my story was very interesting and he wanted to help me. And so I really used his knowledge and expertise to, to help me ultimately create my own film. So it was all self-funded. I bought the camera equipment. Actually, I had the camera equipment from a previous expedition. And then everything else, I just taught myself how to edit on YouTube and how to go about purchasing archive footage and sourcing music and, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was fully funded and, and fully self-edited as well. And it was good fun. What software did you use? I used uh, Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, it was, again, I used the same software as my mentor so that if I had any technical questions about how to do something, I could just ask him. But in the end, I actually, I used YouTube 
tutorials for you know learning little tips and tricks on how to to do certain things as it's a great you know youtube is a great library of uh tutorials there so it was relatively straightforward was this mentor austin vince yeah so austin vince was my mentor and i met him at his film festival which is called the adventure travel film festival and it takes place every summer in the uk and i'd gone to that festival in 2016 uh, just wanting to see what it was like. I'd heard about it and uh, I was interested in, in the films. And I'd signed up to a couple of workshops, one of which was, you know, directing a film. So I thought that'd be interesting. And I joined it and there were only two of us there. And it was being held uh, with Austin. You know, he was the tutor. And he asked out, you know, each of us what we wanted to get out of it. And the other guy said, oh, I've I've already filmed bits of a music video i'm now looking to into the process of actually producing it and austin said well you don't need to be in this session you need to be in the storytelling session i'll take you in there uh, so i ended up having two and a half hours one-on-one -on -one with austin uh, talking about this idea of walking the length of india and looking at how the history affected people and he was fascinated by it and said do you know what i would love to mentor you to make sure that you come back and I would love to be able to show your film in a couple of years time at this festival and that's exactly what happened nice <laughs> it's it's good when you find someone like that 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 has a similar interest and in drive to you that you're like actually yeah there is there is something about this and I am not you know barking up the wrong tree <laughs> so I think Austin is of course well known for his motorcycle adventures yeah, correct. He's done a lot of them and still does. Did you pick out the music for your for the film? So I picked out the majority of the music for the film, which is a process I find incredibly difficult, trying to get the right mood and the right feeling of a piece of music to go with the emotion that you're trying to convey. Yeah, I did ultimately pick out uh, all of the music and searching through endless music libraries. Uh, but Austin actually wrote the main theme tune for my film uh, which was very generous of him to do that you know at his own expense he got it uh, recorded and uh, properly mixed and everything uh, and I think it's a great great little track it adds a lot to the film you know and it's it's a the piece itself is about my love-hate relationship with India that sort of comes through in the film uh, so yeah it was, a, it was a nice addition to have a custom piece written for me I noticed in the credits that there's a story consultant and a historical consultant. How did those people come into the project? Again, uh, via Austin, really. You know, Austin is well connected. He said, uh, you know, I worked very closely with Austin on the actual storyline. Uh, but because we were both so close to it, he said, actually, we need to get a third person in who is completely impartial to watch you, the edit that you're putting together and help us create those highs, those lows, and take the audience on a journey. And again, with the history consultant, because it's such a, a, a personal topic uh, that affected a lot of people, we wanted to make sure that everything I was saying was historically was factually correct. I didn't want any room for error to be suddenly you know, slated for getting it totally wrong both the story and the history consultants were, were invaluable to the project. It's a great movie. I really enjoyed it. Uh, Thank you. When I, I'll have to admit, when I, when I first went into it and I saw it was an hour, I thought, oh, an hour. And then I watched it and I was like, oh, man, that was really, really good. I mean, it's just a great story. Really, you did a really great job with it. Thank you very much. Uh, you're lucky I didn't send you the, the first edit, which was two and a half hours long. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh yeah it's um again that's that's really the help that austin gave me is is working out what was useful and relevant in the film and what i just had a an emotional attachment to that actually didn't add anything to the story and he gave me a target of getting it to a 60 minute film so that two and a half hours had to be worked down to the 60 minutes that you've seen 
did you enjoy the process and do you have any desire to make another? Yeah, I, I really enjoyed the, the process of making a film. It's incredibly complex, more complex than I'd ever imagined. But I did really enjoy it and I would love to make another film. Yeah, definitely. You've had an opportunity to, um, you mentioned the festival and maybe some other opportunities that you've had to get up in front of audiences and, and speak about this adventure. How's that experience been for you? I really enjoy the process of sort of sharing my film. I love sitting in an audience uh, and watching the film with them and listening to their, their reactions. And it's amazing, you know, bits and pieces that I think are funny, that maybe aren't funny, or bits and pieces that are, you know, draw out a, a particular emotion that I hadn't necessarily thought about prior to, to screening it in front of an audience. So I think uh, getting feedback from an audience is, is incredibly valuable. And, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, I think it, it will help improve my projects moving forwards as well. Where are your interests going to take you next? Well, I'm looking at something in Africa at the moment. It's along a similar theme of trying to understand how a historical event actually, and then the subsequent situation actually affected people within the country. But I need to do a lot more research on that. I've never been to Africa. I've never had a particular draw or interest in it. Um, but this is something that I'm sort of slowly looking into uh, while I'm working to try and work out whether it's actually a viable project or not. How can people find you online if they want to learn more? My website is a great place to get in touch with me, uh, but also, you know, Twitter, Facebook and Instagram are great ways. Uh, you can look at my Instagram handle uh, and they're all the same is uh, at Ollie Hunter Smart. So it's O-L-I-E Hunter Smart. And how do people find the film? So if you want to find the film, there's a link uh, on all my social channels, but you could go to Vimeo on demand and just search for The Road to Independence. Ollie Hunter Smart, thank you for coming on the show and sharing the story of walking through India and the making of The Road to Independence. And uh, yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, best of luck to you on your whatever future project you have. Thank you very much. Yeah, I really appreciate your time and uh, great questions, and I've enjoyed it. Thanks again for listening. This episode was recorded on May 13th, 2020. To send me some feedback, you can do so at paul at thepursuitzone.com. You can also leave me a voice message by going to speakpipe.com slash thepursuitzone. As always, the best way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with your friends. For the subscription links, show notes, and more, visit thepursuitzone.com. Thank you.